Welcome to The Happy Doc, the voice of fulfilled physicians. This show is about bringing inspirational, creative, successful, and happy health professionals to you. Get ready to learn how you can be a happy doctor too. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a beautiful week. And uh, one quick tip to hacking the mind and thinking more positively, and you guys, I'm sure, have heard it, is to be thankful. So as you're listening to this, maybe give this episode a pause. I want you to think of a list of five things that you are absolutely thankful for. Um, You'll notice that just thinking about something that you're thankful for will really uplift you. And if you do this on a consistent basis, you'll notice the uh, positivity that you start to think about as opposed to the negative aspects of your life. It's a great mind hack, um, and I hope you guys implement this on a daily basis. The other thing I wanted to say is huge shout out to the people that are leaving five-star reviews on iTunes. That is super helpful. And if you go onto iTunes and you search the Happy Doc, you'll be able to leave that. Um, It's a a great way for people to see that, you know, we're doing great things here. In terms of the five-star reviews, we have one latest one that says, from My Name is Doc, and it's titled Breath of Fresh Air. What wonderful podcasts you have on this channel. I heard one today and I was so uplifted, you can't imagine how much I am looking forward to listening to the rest that are now available and the rest to come in the future. Uh, Thank you so much. My name is Doc. Um, Really appreciate the five-star review. Now for our next guest, Dr. Alex King. He's a recent graduate from medical school such as myself, and um, it's great to learn about the field he's going to go into, osteopathic manipulative medicine. I'm a huge fan of osteopathy, and for listeners who aren't familiar, you'll get to learn about what that is and how he combines his passion of art with his work in osteopathic medicine. It's a really interesting conversation. We get into, you know, how he combines those two aspects. We talk about mindfulness meditation, uh, meditation in general, and how it's positively impacted his life. So we hope that you really enjoy this episode. Uh, Take a listen, and if you get something out of it, please share on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and word of mouth. We really appreciate it. If you want to learn more about our guest, Alex King, check out his website, jwonking.com. That's J-A-E-W-O-N-G.com. And you'll see a lot of his great artwork and blog posts. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. This is Taylor from The Happy Doc. We have an awesome next guest. He's a student about to become an intern next year. And he also happens to attend... Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, Yeah, my name is Alex. I am a fourth year right now, getting ready to graduate with Taylor, so we're both pretty excited. I'm going to be an intern at Roxborough and Chestnut Hill Hospitals, affiliated with PCOM next year. And then hopefully after that, I'll be going into the two-year OMM, NMM residency at school. So... I'm really excited. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you. And uh, the first thing I want to mention, uh, you know, we are introducing you to the medical artist section of the page for a specific reason. So I'm actually looking at his website. It's J-A-E-W-O-N-K-I-N-G.com. That's jwonking.com. And it's just a compilation of all of the amazing art you do. And so how long have you been doing art for? So I really started, you know, in preschool drawing pictures, you know, kind of typical crayon on construction paper type deal. But uh, my mom actually saw that I love to draw so much. And being the child psychiatrist she is kind of spurred me on and gave me more and more things to do in terms of art and enrolled me in private classes when I was in grade school. So it kind of all evolved from that and then going in in high school to taking art courses and yeah, pretty much starting back then. That's great. Um, And you know, I'm I'm looking at some of these pieces right now and uh, guys, you should really check out, you know, some of this work. The colors are amazing. Um, There's so many different like textures and uh, it's it's pretty abstract. So how would you describe the art that you do? Yeah, I would say, you know, it really, I identify it as uh, abstract expressionism, although that is uh, kind of like a pretty 
often used term. I think that fits it quite well. Uh, what I really try and do is, is not inhibit my um, subconscious in terms of what I want to express or what forms I'm drawing. I just kind of let it come out without any filters. So yeah, I'd say that's kind of how I, I'd identify that. That's great. Yeah. So awesome artwork. It's great to have you again. And um, I want to go back a little bit to you're talking about how your mom kind of cultivated your interest in art. That's that's really cool. So how did that happen? She just noticed that you just had a kind of aptitude for it. Yeah. So I actually had this like fascination fascination with monsters. So I would draw like all these monsters that were in my imagination or that I thought were hiding under my bed or in my closet to kind of I guess, come to terms with monsters maybe existing. Um, and she thought that was very interesting and kind of was like, hey, draw more of them and draw, you know, other things like draw me and dad or draw, you know, whatever you're thinking about. So that really allowed me to connect with my imagination and creativity. Um, and, you know, it was really, she was the one who kind of bought me any art materials I wanted and really thought that I had a talent there. So, you know, I'll always be appreciative for that course. Wow, that, that's really great. Um, I love that, you know, so early, you know, they were able to kind of discover this passion, or, you know, intrinsic draw, so to speak, and then kind of were able to cultivate that for you. That's, that's really great. Yeah, um, so I want to connect this a little bit. How do you think? How do you think if anything, has your art influenced your work in uh, medicine and being a student? So I really think uh, the creative process and being comfortable in uh, kind of the unknown uh, really helps me in figuring out problems and thinking outside of the box, so to speak, because in medicine, a lot of times things are very algorithmic and very calculated. Um, and that, you know, I'm comfortable, comfortable with that, of course, but I'm also very comfortable in exploring what's not being seen or, or what is not yet discovered. So that is kind of the exciting realm for me. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I think about medicine, there's so much to be learned, there's so much to be explored. And I often, I don't know, you can agree with me or uh, give me your point of view on this. Uh, I often think that a lot of people are kind of stuck in the thinking logical process and sometimes you can't explain everything and that gets people really stuck. Um, it it kind of sounds like your um, artwork and your exploration in the uh, more intuitive work, so to speak, has allowed you to really come to come to grips with that and even enjoy the unknown. Yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, what's just exciting for me is exploring my own actual manual skill in terms of what I'll be going into in OMM. It's just almost like a pure expression of my artistry just in another way. So that's ultimately why I chose uh, to pursue the route that I'm going. And, um, you know, of course, like medicine, the hard medicine, like labs and, and you know, things like that will provide its own role uh, in my work. But uh, I really just want to kind of push the limits of my own creativity in terms of healing others and see where that goes from there. That's great. Um, so with that being said, uh, not every listener, you know, is going to know exactly what um, OMM or osteopathic manipulative medicine is. Can you kind of explain some of the basic principles, philosophy, and, and what you're going to be going into? Sure. So OMM is really, uh, as also known as osteopathic manipulation, is really using the body's tensegrity system, um, which is essentially how physics acts on tissues of the body as we participate in daily life. Uh, and I'll be kind of working with that system and kind of manipulating the tissues, but also just providing uh, kind of a backdrop for the body to heal itself uh, by providing this feedback loop of me kind of with my hands on the body, seeing what's going on, and the body actually can respond to that uh, touch. So that is what OMM is all about. Yeah, and and, and the underlying principle, and, and this is 
kind of what brings it all together is our, our bodies are innately able to heal itself. You know, our systems go through a lot of, you know, trauma, um, pounding from, you know, our daily use, and yet somehow we're able to function every day. And so the underlying principle is that we're able to heal. And so using human touch, um, we're able to kind of utilize the other person's body um, to allow us to heal. And um, I think you would agree, we could talk about this for, for hours, I'm sure, um, the lack of touch in um, current westernized medicine. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. I had this great example, actually, this last week, I'm on my emergency medicine rotation, a uh, patient presented with, you know, chronic neck pain for the last year due to a whiplash injury. And she's been having these really bad headaches, you know, chronic headaches that have even changed her mood, her outlook on life, um, how she relates to others. And she was going to see a neurologist. Uh, you know, this is the third neurologist she's seen for an opinion. Um, and I kind of heard the history uh, and recognized it as possibly a tension driven headache just from, you know, tight paraspinal neck musculature. So I went over, you know, asked, hey, could I just try something, just do some light soft tissue work on your neck, see how it responds. And, you know, she had so much relief just from that one treatment of me just resting my hands under her head. And I wasn't really doing much of the work. It was it was her kind of relaxation that came about that allowed those muscles to um, get less tight. So, yeah, I mean, touch is not really utilized or recognized as a therapeutic treatment, even though it could only take um, just a minute to provide relief. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a great example, and it kind of opens up to this this question of, you know, I think when we just think about the labs, the numbers and the values, we for, we can often forget what we're seeing um, and how to properly heal that person with the, the correct, not saying that there's, there's a correct treatment, but there's multiple ways. And this is just another way of healing specifically, you know, OMT or osteopathic manipulative treatment um, gives you the tools with your hands to deal with something, for example, like headaches. But what other what other kind of disease states um, can OMT help? I, you know, headaches is a is a good example. But what are other processes that maybe a a doctor, or any health health professional sees on a daily basis? Um, but you know, we could also help with help treat with our hands as well? I would say, you know, the main uh, things we see in the office are obviously lower back pain. That's like the bread and butter of OMT and also neck pain, um, any kind of traumatic injury that might not necessitate a surgery, but still is very uncomfortable and can last for very chronic, you know, very chronic injuries that last for years. So um, let's say someone has keep spraining their ankle in basketball and rolling their ankle, um, you know, that might not require a surgery, but it's still going to change their whole gait pattern and cycle. And that kind of moves up to the hips and can move up to the lower back and to the neck and shoulders. So really just the fact that our bodies are connected by fascia, one small injury could throw a wrench in someone's whole system, no matter how big or small. So, uh, Really, it's it's not only limited to musculoskeletal pathology, but can also extend into these kind of cranial dysfunctions, like someone with chronic migraine, or um, you know who who just bumped their head on a cabinet and can't think properly for the next month or so for for some reason. Um, so yeah, OMT is very useful in these instances. Yeah, that's 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 a great great point. Um, so a common question I think a lot of people ask, and you know, you you hear it every day, and I've heard it almost every day in my um, my own OMM rotation is, what's the difference between uh, a chiropractor and you know an osteopathic doctor who use, utilizes these techniques? And I'm not phrasing this question to bash either field. You know, I think there's a lot of utilities in in every field of, of medicine and the health professionals. Um, but so, so what's kind of like the common differences? What are we learning that's, that's different? That's a great question. I get this, you know, question probably most of, 
of any question. Um, so chiropractic medicine, I've actually been treated by a chiro chiropractor and you know, a lot of them do very, very great work. Uh, so their modality of treatment tends to be a high velocity, low amplitude approach, which is one of the techniques we learn as DOs as well. Um, this approach uh, mobilizes joints, specifically uh, in the spine, uh, the axial skeleton. So a chiropractor might identify a key lesion. Let's say you have a restricted cervical uh, vertebrae. So they'll, they'll give your neck a good twist and crack your neck, but also get your spine as well, and maybe even your SI and anominates. So their approach is generally, from my experience, more of a um, kind of mobilize the whole axial spine, see how the body recovers after that. And typically you need uh, repeat treatments. You know, there's lots of examples of people have a, uh, you know, a chiropractor they see over years and years and years. Um, whereas in terms of OMT, I find that it is a very targeted approach and the best osteopathic physicians try to find the key lesion. So this might not even be in the skeleton, axial skeleton itself. It could just be a rib dysfunction that's throwing everything off. Could be um, just the way someone kind of participates in their movement day to day. They're not um, at work, they're not lifting things correctly, or they're not walking with a kind of mechanically um, sound gait. So uh, not only do we aim to correct certain dysfunctions in joints, but we also look for just movement patterns as well. Um, and we also mobilize fascia. We're essentially doctors of fascia, right? Because this is what connects everything in the body, muscles to bone to ligaments, everything. So we try and find those restrictions, not just the ones in specific joints. Awesome. And, you know, I'm listening to this and obviously I've been trained in this field. So I just want listeners to have you know, some definitions so, for example, the axial skeleton he was talking about is more of the central spine, whereas appendicular would be talking about the bones coming off of the axial skeleton, like the arms and the legs. So that's like some definitions there. He's talking about the key lesion, and that's essentially talking about a, an osteopathic doctor will survey the body and try to find out the point in which most of the trauma or the pain or... Uh, that's probably the best way to describe it is coming from and when you treat that lesion or area then the you know the main issues can resolve so it's a more like you said a focused approach and um it's it's just a really great field and the one thing i love about you know do school is we get exposed to another way of treating besides just using medication so it really opens up the doors for a lot of you know great ways and modalities to, to treat others. Um, so to spin off of that, um, what, what do you think, you know, I think often that the greater, the greater world of medicine and also specifically patients and clients, they're not even exposed to this, this world. So what, what are, hmm, how should I describe this? What, what is, something special about a DO doctor that people don't really understand, you know, the, the differences between an MD and a DO and what can an osteopath allow for someone's treatment? So, um, in my opinion, the main thing that really separates us, um, is our pretty much required practice in touching human tissue. So, we have labs that we go to every week as DOs that we need to treat our fellow students and learn these techniques to um, affect the tissues of the body. Uh, lots of MDs might have this interest. However, their curriculum does not require actual labs where you're in there feeling someone else's you know, spine, seeing if there's any um, abnormality. So we have you know, hours and hours and hours of this training to evaluate and treat um, dysfunctions in, you know, just basic human anatomy. So for me, uh, that is the main difference. And after, whether you like it or not, after doing these labs, you do get a sense of um, how healthy tissue feels. So when you're in the wards or in the hospital feeling unhealthy areas, 
you can recognize that as an osteopathic doctor, whereas someone without that training might not necessarily realize um, that difference. Sure. And, and I can speak to this a little bit, you know, there's something about the learning experience of touching lots of people that it's almost like your, your hands, your hands just know, and it's not a cognitive thing. It's, it's an experiential learning. So, you know, the, the hours and hours of lab work and, you know, the clinical rotations we go on, um, do train our hands to feel things that maybe, um, less trained hands would not feel. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And it can almost be somewhat of a subconscious uh, learning experience, whereas there's no conscious way to be like, this is healthy um, because my fingers are moving, you know, a centimeter less downwards than tissue that's on. It's not really like that. It's all of this experiential um, kind of maneuvering that we do day to day based on our labs. It's like, all right, this person's health feels a little different than this other person's healthy tissue, but I can recognize that they're both moving in a way that expresses that health. So it's very ethereal, kind of very esoteric, but at the same time, you do get this experience, especially when you start working with sick patients. You can almost feel like specific types of dysfunctions and diseases. Like there's a definite feel to a CHF leg, or, you know, someone who's got chronic diabetic neuropathy and, you know, there's, there's signs and things you can definitely get a sense of. Sure, sure. And, and this is kind of the beautiful tie-in with your artwork, you know. So how, how do you link up, you know, OMM and these types of treatments that you're going to go into and, and art? Um, So I think the major link is that creativity and comfortable uh, feeling with the unknown. So when someone comes in with a certain pain, let's say they have back pain, um, the thing about that is their dysfunction or their key area that needs to be treated might not even be in their back. It could be a dysfunction in their shoulder or in their neck or something that isn't even painful. So Um, To be comfortable in the arts is, I think, very key in at least my specialty uh, because you really have to look for areas that are, you know, outside of the box and are not necessarily the same for every person. So literally, we're all built differently. We all um, function differently in the world. And you have to kind of respect that in terms of when you're looking for the reason of someone's discomfort. Um, you know, someone who has back pain who comes in, I'm going to look at their whole body. I'm not just going to focus on, Oh, maybe they need to just get a lower back like x-ray or something like that. Uh, I want to feel the tissues in their feet, see, uh, what shoes they're wearing. I want to know what job they have, what their hobbies are. I really am looking at, um, everything that makes a person, you know, a person. So I just want to know, Um, all of these things and then come up with a creative solution to what I think the problem is. And I really think that um, when doing my art and letting my subconscious flow through unimpeded, I think that helps me in the creative process of thinking, well, why does this person come in with such an atypical presentation? Um, So I think that uh, that kind of process really helps, uh, helps me when I treat other people. Sure. And I'm actually going to tie this in a little bit. I really love what you said about getting to know the patient, you know, on a deeper level and getting to know them, you know, what do they do for a living? You know, what shoes are they wearing? All of those things. Um, I had a discussion with another osteopathic um, physician and we were talking about someone's, you know, physical um, issues that were going on. And we actually thought the key lesion or the area that this person actually needed to work on in order to open up her body was some of her emotional anxieties and stressors. So it's kind of in an osteopathic way or in terms of the principles, 
healing the person doesn't actually always mean doing the physical touch. The, the true healing and what's holding them back might be um, an environmental factor or an emotional factor. Um, have you experienced something like that in terms of you know the patients you've interacted with? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I've looked at lots of studies too that uh, focus on mindset and how we experience pain, for example. So my interest is really big into meditation and mindfulness and seeing how that changes the pathways that regulate pain and the way we sense our bodies. So um, even emotions, let's say you're very stressed or very anxious in some point of your life, you're going to notice that your pain is amplified by that um, just as a side effect of your sympathetics being, you know, hyperstimulated. Um, I can even feel this in many patients that I've treated. So I found areas of restriction to be the diaphragm, like very big in the diaphragm with emotional stress, as well as the neck musculature. So someone with these areas of restriction they don't even have to tell me. I can feel their diaphragm or these specific areas and be like, so how's how's your life going? Like, are you going through anything at tough times? Or, um, you know, tell me about what's going on. So oftentimes that can unlock a whole new area to delve into in terms of helping our patients and seeing how we can help them through these tough times. Sure, sure. Yeah, and it, it's interesting, right? So you, you have a physical diagnosis that makes you think maybe they're having some emotional um, issues or stressors. And then you can talk about those emotional stressors and it almost like relieves some of that stress. And then you might find a new area of physical restriction. So a lot of the time I, I hear this almost described as unraveling. Um, have, have you heard that term from, from other yeah, doctors? Yeah, definitely. So, so it's, um, it's in, Osteopathic manipulative treatment is a very interesting field. It's, it's, it's quite different from the very mechanical, logical um, medicine, and they're both useful in different ways. So it's, uh, it's really great to, to get a sense of that. And it, it's awesome that you know Alex um, is, is going into this field. To change gears a little bit, um, I wanted us to discuss, um, especially for the, the younger students, what have been some of the um, skills that you've learned through medical school that maybe you wished you would have, have you wish you would have learned a little bit sooner um, that you could maybe impart to students going through this process, especially the ones taking boards and who are really stressed out? Yeah, so I think that one of the main things uh, people under stress should focus on are um, finding comfort in physical exertion of the body. Uh, this is just a crucial part of who humans are in terms of evolution, in terms of how our nervous system and autonomics work. Uh, we need some kind of exertion in our day in order to maintain a healthy state of mind, whether that for you is running, biking, lifting weights, swimming, you know, anything that requires some kind of physicality because that's just kind of how we evolved is we evolved as people who, um, you know, worked a lot outside, you know, made sure to get enough sunlight, things like that. Um, it said a lot, you know, and it makes a lot of sense, but it's true. At least I've found it to be, be true. Um, but not only is our physical well-being important, but also in terms of our mental well-being, um, I've always been a huge proponent of mindfulness and meditation, whether it is five minutes a day or an hour a day or just however much time you wish to devote in your practice. Uh, it's, it's such a simple way to make a huge impact in just how we maintain our mental health and be happier as people. Uh, I, I really recommend, I'm not paid by this app or anything, but I've used Headspace um, and thought it was a great way to kind of start your journey. Um, but now I've got my own practice and try and, you know, use my own techniques, but that's a great way to start. Um, there's a bunch of other apps out there, but I think finding your own way to physically exert and recover and then mentally explore your inner consciousness and the way you think um, this great quote I, I often think about is, uh, if you want to know how your mind works, 
just sit back and observe it. You know, it's not, not a very complicated thing. So I would say those two are my biggest recommendations for new med students or people just in general who are feeling the effects of stress. Great, great. Yeah. So in, in summary, you know, exercise and meditation has been pretty key for you. And, and I can definitely chime in and say that those, those two things have been very helpful in my own life. What effects, you know, what effects have you noticed in your own life uh, as soon as you kind of started your meditation journey? So the major thing uh, I've found in my life is enjoying being alive in the present moment. That is a huge thing where, you know, something could always comes up. It's almost inevitable that you're stuck in traffic or something doesn't go the way you would have liked. However, life is this long journey and we need to appreciate different parts of it. And the best way to do that is to just take a step back in that moment and just realize, hey, you know, things happen. Um, Certain things may not be in your control, but that's okay. Uh, You you can let them kind of wash over you. Um, Enjoy even the discomfort of that moment because you know uh, that you'll rebound from it and you'll be better for it. So I think that is the biggest thing. And also just, um, you know, not sweating the small, small stuff. Like if I'm stuck in traffic, uh, yeah, traffic sucks. Um, but you know, we all kind of have to deal with it and it'll go away. It's not going to be like your life is stuck in traffic forever. So I feel like appreciating the, the moments in life where, um, there is that kind of internal struggle. It's an opportunity to also become better. So I think that is the main thing I've found through meditation. And also it helps in every other aspect, just maintaining that clarity, that focus, that willingness to see the light side and be optimistic, uh, I think is what has changed for me. Sure, sure. So it's really ultimately provided you um, a sense of resilience in in all situations. And in, in some cases, you're almost appreciate the difficult times because it allows you to grow as a, as a human. That's, that's really great. And that, um, kind of ties in with the, a sense of positive, the positive mindset that a lot of, you know, happier, um, people show and, and exemplify in their lives is, is like what you talked about. You, you perceive difficulties as challenges, um, and struggles to improve upon, rather than necessarily thinking that it's a terrible um, thing that's happened in your life. So definitely great uh, to hear that. And uh, meditation is, is a fantastic way to find calm in the storm. So um, also one thing that uh, I think would be great for you to provide, do you have any resources, books, websites, uh, people you follow um, that you think have been very impactful in your life and have allowed you to find, you know, peace, greater happiness and knowledge um, that you might impart to others. And also, um, if someone's interested in OMT, maybe even if they're, you know, an MD um, or in other health health professionals, how might they explore the field and learn more um, about how they might be a part of it? Sure. So um, I've got a couple book recommendations. Um, my first one would be The Mind Illuminated. I, I forget who's the author right now, but it is a great way to at least read and gain a better understanding of how to start one's meditation journey and just to kind of see what mindfulness is. Um, I got that off Amazon and have really enjoyed following along with that. Um, also, the I believe it's called The Surrender Experiment. Um, But that is another book of just a story of how just surrendering to what life has in store for you can actually provide um, a more kind of happy journey throughout life. Um, That is another one I really like to read. Um, So for MDs and people not exposed to OMT, uh, I believe there are classes that DOs offer to kind of learn and Um, explore OMM and even get certifications and various techniques in OMT um, that, yeah, that are offered online. So if you do a quick Google search, you can find a class that interests you. Uh, But I think really the 
um, the amount of DOs coming into the medical field now has been higher than it's ever been. And I'm sure that, you know, almost all MDs um, know at least one DO somewhere or at least an osteopathic student. Uh, I think maybe even approaching your colleagues and just being like, hey, you know, I, I heard about this thing, osteopathic manipulation. Uh, have you experienced, you know, any great uh, results from it or do you use it? And even just allowing us to teach each other, I think, is a great way to not only make friends, but also just to become um, more well-versed in how we treat patients. So uh, if you know a DO or a student, just be like, hey, show me just one technique that you like to use or that you think could help um, my patients. So uh, I think that would be a great resource as well. Um, and I'll be sure to let you know, Taylor, if I think of any other good resources uh, that I've come across over my journey. But uh, yeah, I, I think those are, are my suggestions. Great, great. And um, another question that came to mind, um, and I think is really common, especially in the pre-med world, is, you know, when everyone's applying to medical schools, they often are concerned about how, how might being an MD versus being a DO impact their future career as a doctor. So let me ask you, in your experience, has being a DO made it more difficult to explore, you know, different specialties? Have your friends been able to match um, and explore, you know, any specialty that an MD might go into? Yeah, uh, uh, I would say that in this day and age, I have personally felt no no discrimination or really anything at all that would differentiate um, the opportunities that would be given to an MD student. So uh, I fully embrace being a DO and really appreciate the education I've had. Um, all of my friends who are in school have been able to match at you know their top places uh, regardless. So I think now you're seeing a much greater acceptance of DOs in the field and not just in you know, family medicine or the primary care specialties, but also, you know, in the highest, um, you know, echelons of like specific specialties, like the derms and orthos. And we've had a great match here, at least in our class from what I've seen. So I would say the main thing you would like to think about when applying to school or choosing, uh, you know, allopathic or MD versus DO is just the type of education you want to receive. Um, I believe that as DOs, we just get more hands-on um, time and have to learn a, another subject of osteopathic manipulation. So if that interests you, then maybe DO school is right for you. But I would not necessarily choose based on a perceived notion of, you know, it's easier to get into places as an MD or, um, you know, in some in some places that might be the case, but do you really want to be associated with people who discriminate just based on a degree? Like, I don't know if I would. So um, I would say that choose based on your passion. That's always what I think is the most fulfilling option and the most true to yourself. Um, you know, based on what you think you want to contribute to the world, that is the path that you should go. Awesome. And I think that's what you just said was a, a great conclusion statement is is to follow what feels right for you and choose your passion and that also really also falls in line very well with you know the artwork that you're doing um you know you, you didn't just choose art in terms of you know your creative work but you kind of chose art in your vocation and career as well and it's it's really shown to to tie in and into your life so not only are you being integrative in your health career, but you're kind of being integrative in, in your life. And it's very exciting for me to see someone who's kind of following um, their passion in that line. So thank you very much, Alex. I want everyone to check out jwanking.com and check out some of Alex's artwork. Um, and it's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks again, Taylor. Yeah, I had a great time uh, talking about these things and maybe we could do it again sometime. Sounds great. All right. Take care.
Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed this episode and we want you to definitely subscribe to our social media channels. Check out the Happy Doc on Facebook, iTunes, Twitter, and Instagram. Please like, subscribe, share, and send us feedback. And please check out the website www.thehappydoc.com. Again, we hope you enjoyed The Happy Doc, the voice of fulfilled physicians. Peace out. <laughs>